All right. Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Sherry Krasel, and I'd like to welcome you to the first in the series for the fall of 2022 of our Noontime Chatters with staff at the Miami University Art Museum and special guests. This month's theme is Interconnected, Miamia Center and Miami Students on Tribal Sovereignty. Uh, today's program is being recorded and will be posted on the Art Museum's YouTube channel as soon as possible. Our host today is Curator of Exhibitions, Jason Shaman. And at this time, I will turn the program over to him. Jason. Thank you, Sherry. Welcome, everyone. Really pleased to kick off the semester's noontime chatters with this wonderful opportunity with colleagues and students. Uh, first though, I would like to take a moment to read the Art Museum's land acknowledgement. The Miami University Art Museum respectfully acknowledges the Shawnee and Miamia people who along with other indigenous groups were the first stewards of the land we now occupy. I uh, would like to go ahead and introduce uh, our panelists today. Uh, we have, and uh, very much appreciate all of their involvement. We have George Ironstrack, who is Assistant Director of the Miamia Center and the Director of Education. And Kara Strass, who is the Director of Miami, of Miami Tribe Relations uh, at the Miamia Center. And we're really fortunate to have with us four students, all who participate and submitted uh, and are featured in the student response exhibition. Uh, just go alphabetical by uh, last name. We have Kayla Becker, who is a freshman in computer science and is a member of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma. Eva Fox, who is a freshman in studio art with a minor in art history and a member of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma. Megan Sekulich, a senior in studio art with a minor in fashion and a member of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma. And Layla Troyer, who is a recent graduate uh, who majored in communication design with a minor in Japanese and also a member of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma. So we'll have some questions that we're going to introduce to our panelists. Just very quickly, just wanted to mention uh, our gratitude to the Miamia Center, particularly George and Kara for collaborating with the museum, my colleague, Sherry Grazel, as well as our collections manager and registrar, Lars Stewart. Uh, the five of us, uh, collaborate in the development of this student response exhibition, uh, which is connected with the university's focus theme of tribal sovereignty. So we're really uh, very pleased. We had uh, a great number of submissions from students, wide ranging uh, studies and years at Miami and uh, the final selection of 31 pieces. Uh, so please do make time to come uh, and see this wonderful exhibition. So uh, let's go ahead and jump in uh, so we make sure we have enough time for our panelists. So George, I'm going to throw the first question out to you. Can you please explain what sovereignty means and how it applies to the Miami tribe of Oklahoma, both, both past and present? Um, yeah, I'd be happy to tackle that first question, Jason. Um, and it's a it's a really good question. It's also a really big question. We could actually spend the whole hour just discussing the answer to that question. So I'll I'll just give a a summary that'll give us a good starting point um, to think of sovereignty in the context of of this exhibition. And I'm going to lean here on the work of the Dakota scholar Vine Deloria Jr., who wrote a really excellent essay in the late 1970s called uh, Self-Determination and the Concept of Sovereignty. So he's looking specifically at sovereignty from a tribal perspective. And he begins by framing sovereignty as a legal political um, concept as kind of the baseline understanding 
and in sort of the, the world of European nation states, um, he says that, quote, sovereignty was the absolute power of a nation to determine its own course of action with respect to other nations. Um, so it's very much framed from the perspective of nations that were engaging in colonial activities in North America and other places. And he wrestles with how this definition doesn't fit tribal nations in the past or tribal nations at the time he was writing in the 1970s, that tribal nations um, certainly have historically prior to contact with Europeans, um, inherent power to determine their own course of action as peoples. They're distinct and different from other tribal peoples. We have our own land bases, our own languages, our own cultures, our own systems of governance. Um, but that power was never viewed as being absolute. It was always understood to be interdependent, reliant on alliances and connections to other people, um, as well as having, having other kinds of um, limits placed upon it. And so through the course of the essay, he really wrestles with this kind of isolationist um, power dynamic where um, he, he talks about nations looking at whether they have the ability to do something rather than the wisdom to actually do it um, and begins to to outline a couple of different definitions that look at sovereignty more as an integrated and holistic thing uh, from a tribal perspective that includes and this is really important for us in our discussion today elements of cultural integrity that just because a nation possesses the power to do things irrespective of what other nations want um, for a tribal perspective doesn't mean they have true sovereignty because maintaining cultural integrity is important to continuance as a people and without the ability to bring people together and coordinate action and agree on a, a, a unified sense of being a collective understanding of peoplehood then the legal political powers in the end become sort of meaningless, or uh, as people might say today, it might mean that, that you've, you've, your um, inherent sovereignty has been co-opted by the concepts of other people. Um, perhaps you could call that colonization. And so I really like, um, he, he ends his, his essay by saying that sovereignty is, quote, a useful word to describe the process of growth and awareness that characterizes a group of people working toward and achieving maturity. And when we when we talk about this with our students in class, we emphasize that 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 journey of sort of achieving maturity, unlike for, let's say, an individual person, when it's a community, it's a striving that's never fully achieved. So you're always working at becoming more mature as a community because there's so many things constantly changing around you in the world in terms of other people in your environment. And so that sovereignty, um, looking at sovereignty as a process that takes into account cultural integrity as wonderful through lines then to the to the world of art that I think we'll we'll hear from our students today. Thank you, George. You know, obviously, sovereignty is quite a complex concept. And, you know, we grappled with that a little bit when we were developing the student response exhibition call for art. And as we broke it down into three core concepts of land, identity, and community. Uh, and you kind of touched on those. And it was so interesting to see how different students, and we'll hear from uh, uh, a few in, in a moment, but how students responded sometimes to only one of those three and sometimes to uh, several of them, uh, which I think really made the topic more approachable for many. So thank you for that. So, uh, Kara, uh, question for you. As the director of tribe relations with Miamia Center, how do you explore the topic of sovereignty when you're working with students at Miami and, and perhaps students who are of uh, the Miami tribe of Oklahoma, but perhaps also students who have no affiliation? Yeah, sure. Um, and first, I will say I apologize if you hear any uh, noise in the background. I'm currently at a community workshop. Um, there might be some power tools that, that come on in the middle. Um, but I think this is a really interesting question. And I, I first want to give a little bit of context that the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma and Miami University have had a relationship for 50 years. Um, this relationship is very unique. We don't know of any other institution um, and tribal nation in the country that have a relationship like this. And one of the things that makes this relationship so unique 
is that Miami University acknowledges the sovereignty of the Miami tribe in many ways. Um, when the Miami Center was created in 2001, I don't think they really understood what, what this could look like. Um, but as the work moved forward, both the tribe and the university were starting to think about what it means to have um, a center that's working on projects and programs and research for a tribal nation. And so when the first legal documents were put into place, and that didn't happen until 2006, there was thought about things like intellectual property rights. And when the Miamia Center is doing research on Miamia ways of knowing, that should really be owned by the Miamia community, by the Miami tribe, and not by Miami University. And so that's something that's very unique. Um, for people who work in universities, we know that intellectual property is, is something that is typically owned by the university and not individuals. Um, but in this instance, it was very important that if this relationship was going to continue forward, um, that the university would recognize the sovereignty of the nation through things like intellectual property rights. And there's many other examples of how the university acknowledges the sovereignty of the tribe. Um, and so that's something that we talk about quite a lot on campus is just what is this relationship? Why do we have this relationship? And how does our work serve the, the tribe rather than the university? When we talk about our Miami Heritage students, they take a series of courses with us. Um, this year we're focused on language and culture. Next year will be contemporary topics and sovereignty. And the third year, um, ecological perspectives and history. And so we do actually have one year in which sovereignty is a main theme. Um, and so we think about much of what George just talked about. What is sovereignty? What does it mean to us as individuals and as citizens of a tribal nation? And how do we express that sovereignty, both as individual people and as collective? And in the second semester, we actually transitioned to thinking about sovereignty through art. Um, and we acknowledge you know, what art looks like in our community, in other communities. And then we ask the students to express these ideas um, by creating a design, a, a t-shirt design, um, that at the end of the, of the school year, students actually vote, and then we print one of those um, that all of our students receive. And so I think there's some interesting ways in which we connect sovereignty to a variety of other topics. And really everything that we discuss in the class is related to sovereignty in some way. And I think that it can be hard for people to understand sovereignty outside of the political or outside of the legal. But when we talk about food, about land, about art, language, all of these things are connected to sovereignty and our ability as Miamia people to decide how we express ourselves as a community. No, thank you. And, and you know, it, what you say strikes a, a core with me on the relationship that the Art Museum has had with the Miamia Center because as with the past exhibitions and even exhibition uh, forthcoming uh, that we're working on together on the painted robes is that the all of the interpretation is all driven by Miamia. It's not that the art museum is interpreting, the voice is coming from the people who live um, who have those connections. And, and I see that as, as being, you know, the sovereignty over the development of the exhibitions, which I think is really important because then there's that authentic voice uh, that often can be lost otherwise. So, I mean, it was like when we worked on the, uh, the ribbon work exhibition, uh, you know, that was such a meaningful opportunity. And I think for a lot of the museum staff and others, we learned so much through you. Uh, so uh, we, we look forward to continuing that dialogue uh, in there. Uh, 
So I want to open up to uh, some of the students. I'm going to uh, actually ask uh, Kayla and, and Leila about uh, this question of how do you consider the topic of sovereignty in terms of being both Miamia and Miami University students? And I, I know, Leila, you know, you're a recent graduate, but you could still obviously reflect on your, your time here. But uh, if one of you wants to take the lead, we'd love to hear uh, from you more on this. Sure. Um, like you said, I am a recent graduate, but during my junior year is when I uh, attended the contemporary topics in the heritage program. And I didn't really know what sovereignty was before that year, like at all, even outside of Miamia terms. Um, but uh, as I went through that year and learned a lot more about how my culture is applied, not just to like within my community, but externally, how the world sees us, how I can participate in it and help us grow. Um, I learned that that is an essential part of building community and also helped me better understand how my identity, I guess, is developing around that. Uh, in terms of being Miamia, a Miami University student, and then who I am outside of that as well. Uh, I really wouldn't have come to Miami University without my Miamia ties at all. Um, so going through the program really helped me better understand my cultural identity, um, the perspectives of other Miamia students and people, and uh, helped me understand the empowerment that results from the relationship between the tribe and the university. I agree with Layla. I probably would not have come to Miami if it wasn't for that tie. Um, and it, it's very neat that we get to learn about ourselves and our sovereignty through school. That's not something that most people get to learn about. They don't get to find out who they are or their culture or customs or anything like that. Um, I do feel like, as mentioned before, sovereignty is a massive word. Um, the simplest way I, I would describe it, absolute simplest would probably be the ability to govern ourselves. Um, but I like it more on a personal term, I think. Um, I would consider it more of the ability to find who I am, um, learn about who I am, and not just learn about it, but also practice it. And when I say the ability, I don't mean just that I'm capable, but also the fact that I'm capable because we have sovereignty. It's kind of like a cycle. We can't have sovereignty without knowing who we are and our, and our culture. But to know those things, we have to be able to teach ourselves in each other and we can't do that without the sovereignty and so it's kind of like a cycle you have to have one to have the other um and it's it's a neat thing to have both as a tribe and then through school as well then do you both feel in in some ways that what you learned about your own history and and your culture uh as miamia uh, affected in any way how you felt when when you're at Miami? Did you have a time where you felt more Miamia versus Miami University student, <laughs> or had that had, had that evolved for you at all? Um, for me, I have before I came to this university, I have had a background understanding my Miamia identity. My family is active in the community. However, ever since going to university, I think I have had like kind of a fluctuating sense of am I a Miami University student? Am I, am I a Miami student? I'm both. And I don't think one ever has overtaken the other, but I did come into this experience Miami and I am exiting university as a Miami a graduate of Miami University. So over time, I think it's just, I think the word matured for sovereignty has 
been used earlier in this talk. I think that is what I've been feeling is actively is that maturing identity and the intertwining of it all. I am a non-traditional student and that was something very difficult for me to adjust to. Um, and so mentally, I was not sure that I was going to feel like I belonged as a Miami student. Um, and I think that being a Miami student got rid of those fears and made me feel like I do belong. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm sure, it, you know, finding your your comfort zone uh and and i think it's interesting you know that my next question for uh even and megan uh kind of you know it's it's related but uh, for the two of you how much has your understanding of tribal sovereignty influenced your feelings about coming to miami uh, and and being in a region that once belonged to your ancestors. I mean, what what was part of your decision making, and how easy was that, or how hard was it? If Eva or Megan, whoever. So as far as like um, the physical place and coming here. Um, Similar to Layla, it's just the, the fact that the Miami Heritage Program opportunity um, was what brought me here. Um, and you know, the the scholarships that are aligned with that. But like then coming here and learning about like the connection to place, which from um, our classes um, of contemporary issues and learning about sovereignty, uh, the like physical connection to the place I think is something that's really important for our community, especially in a community that is like so spread out currently like across um, the country, or even across the world. So being able to like have and I guess foster that connection to the place myself now that I'm here, it kind of it's like exciting. It's 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 almost like an honor. I'm proud of it because like I do get to create this connection that I didn't once have through this understanding of sovereignty, through this um, uh, understanding of identity that is continuously growing um, all in connection to this place and this culture. And I think it's been, um, once again, like, like Layla said, a, a maturing type of thing of, I didn't really know a lot. I couldn't really define sovereignty outside of a strictly political sense. So learning more about sovereignty from a Miamia perspective as a Miamia person has really helped me define, develop, and then like protect this culture that I'm a part of and this identity that I have that all comes back in like a, a cycle to like this place and these people. Um, <clears throat> I would say for me, like, same thing as the other three said, like, I mostly considered this school because of the Miami program. Um, and a lot of it was because I knew that it was important to me as a person was to grow on my culture and to learn more. Um, and I think learning more about tribal sovereignty Help me to understand how important it is that I am here. Um, and I I didn't really understand that when I first, like my first semester of college. I didn't understand how important it was that we were all here. Um, and it understanding that being at this school where our ancestors once were is very important and it influences a lot and it's definitely made me feel much more proud to be here. Um, and it has, you know, it's definitely changed a lot about, you know, how I feel about myself and my identity. Um, and I think that, you know, after a long time of feeling maybe a little bit disconnected from my heritage, 
being at this school in this place has helped me reconnect and understand the importance of that connection um, to others and to the land. Uh, it's just wonderful to hear. And, you know, you, I think, you know, you, you mentioned something, Eva, that, that triggered for me, um, you know, one of the slogans for the university, and you see, in such a place. And that must have been something really quite powerful for the four of you as students to be in this place. And you have a different experience than most other students. I mean, other students can say, oh, well, my, my father or my grandmother went here and they have that kind of a connection. But for the four of you, it, it's much deeper uh, and, and in ways much more personal, uh, I think. Um, have, have you, and this, you know, just throwing out this question for the four of you, have you ever talked about that with, friends, well, you know, at Miami, who were not Yam Yam? And, and, you know, how have you shared that emotion or that experience, if you have? Um, I can I go. You guys still care. Oh, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. You're okay. good. Um, I know as a freshman, when I first came here, we were doing kind of like icebreakers at the beginning of classes. I didn't know anyone. And the icebreakers are often like, a fun fact about yourself. And I would almost always pick, oh, if you know about the reason Miami University is called Miami University, I'm a part of that tribe. And I know that has sparked some conversations in the past. And all of my friends that I've made from university know a bit about my culture. And I think they have a better understanding of the university and its development and what the tribe is and all that sort of thing. Um, and even uh, talking about stuff outside the university, like events I attend and some language um, and different things like that. Um, all of my friends are aware of at least some of those things. Mine is very similar to Layla's. Um, when I first started, every intro was, hi, I'm Kayla. I'm Miami from the Miami tribe of Oklahoma. Um, and that more so became an educational experience because in almost every class that I would say this in, I would get comments back like, what? Like, that's a thing. I didn't know that that was real or I didn't know that Indians still existed or I, I didn't realize like you guys were still alive. And that's very big statements um, that I was I was shocked that people just think that we are gone. Um, so that's become something that I've been able to use to educate other people as well, not just growing myself, but helping others learn too. I know I've definitely um, <clears throat> shared a lot about my heritage with my friends. Um, it was, um, I like, I grew up being a participant in the tribe and it was one of those things that I had always done. So I kind of forgot that other people didn't really know about it. <laughs> and so like, you know, especially on campus, I thought, oh, well, surely, you know, everybody's going to know what's up. That's completely untrue. And um, so it's been really eye-opening to me getting to, like, actually talk to my friends about this stuff. And, you know, it's nice that they're interested. That's really great. Um, and I think I've always found it important to share it with other people. Um, and especially with people close to me, because then they can ask me questions and then the people closest to me can know more about, you know, my heritage, my culture, all that stuff. Um, so yeah, I definitely took, I take a lot of joy in sharing 
all of this with my with my friends. Yeah, pretty similar to basically everything they've said is just like the ability to share this with the people close to me and how receptive and like eager they are to learn about these things. Um, I have some friends who learn about things from their classes relating to like the, the Miyamiya tribe and the relationship with the university. And if they, they know about it, they'll come back to me excited. Like, guess what I learned in class today? Like talking about this and that. And it's really fun to then they have like a little bit of an upper hand because then like, you know, they know me, they know my closest friends and roommates who are also Miyamiya and then can say like, well, I know a Miyamiya person. And um, these are the things that they've told me and then are using that and then continuing, continuing to share that knowledge, um, which is really, I think, really cool and something that's, you know, unique about being here. Uh, this is awesome to hear. Thank you. You know, obviously, the four of you, the students, submitted works for the exhibition. And again, you you have a different perspective uh, from other students. Um, but, you know, obviously, you know, three of you, you know, were in the Department of Art. Um, you know, Layla, Le you, you recently graduated by communi uh, communication design, formerly graphic design. Uh, and, and Megan, studio art, Eva, um, uh, also studio art. Kayla, you, you uh, a little bit different because you're a computer science. But um, when you were responding to the call for art, uh, what, what was going through, you know, not just your minds, but you know, obviously your hearts, your your experiences. Uh, this was, you know, very well connected for you. Uh, again, on a different way. But how did you approach creating work, you know, for this particular theme? Um, I think for me, I. <clears throat> I made both of my pieces my freshman year, um, I think first semester too. And I, you know, when I was making them, I was going through lots of identity shifts. Um, you know, it was my first time away from home. I'm now a college student. I'm now officially like making art for classes instead of just like for funsies. Um, and so with both of my pieces, I, it was just, they were really a reflection of like needing to take a breath and be like, you know, take it in for a minute because my Miami identity has definitely shifted to um, and shifted a lot my first year here because while I did grow up in the tribe, I did feel disconnected for a bit just because I didn't really have a good resource for the language or um, a lot of the cultural stuff. And so like all of a sudden getting so much of a rush of that information, like my, my first year was like, you know, I, I, was, I was experiencing a lot of change. And I think that really influenced my pieces for sure. Um, and especially, you know, I, I definitely was, reflecting on my Miyamiya heritage like the whole time I was making them and it was I didn't realize it when I was making them but like I realize now like how important art is to our sovereignty and I think that that has really like it's helped me to understand how because like I never thought that me being an artist and making Miyamiya art was like, I didn't know that it would be helpful. <laughs> I, I had never thought about it before. And I'm realizing now that it's, it's actually really important and I'm really grateful for that experience. One of the things um, that 
I, I also made my pieces um, last year and they were actually a part of my um, senior project presentation for our heritage courses, um, which is just like an independent project you do your senior year instead of um, going to the classes every week. And I put together all of the artwork that I had created um, since my freshman year, um, creating pieces like from a Miyamiya perspective, understanding what those aesthetics and um, ideals like really meant and what they looked like and then how that kind of changed and shifted as I understood more how I understood my identity more um, and just the expression of my identity as an act of sovereignty was something that grew I think from that project um, especially as I started taking those aesthetics and very like particular colors and shapes and images and molding them into something that was more suited to my artistic style and like how I prefer to express myself. And so I guess the process of making this like artwork is like super, super personal and, you know, having it, writing about it and having it on display, it, it opens um, uh, the floor for I guess, uh, dialogue and conversations about how I reached that point and like what it means to be Miyamiya, what it means for me as a Miyamiya person to make that art, what it means for Miyamiya people to look at that art, what it means for non-Miyamiya people to look at that art and like how all that is like, I don't know, just wrapped up in this like nice little image that I like to look at. <laughs> and that just like, yeah, I guess the expression of those images like Eva said, I didn't realize would be such an important thing, but has become such an integral part of like my growth as an artist and as a person and as a Miyamiya artist. Um, for my, similar to those two, uh, I also didn't realize the importance of what I'm creating. Um, when I was making my piece, it's based off of a sketch from a project in class actually that I didn't make. Um, so it just kind of sat around, uh, but then I revisited it when I was kind of in a moment of frustration with myself and my identities were clashing and it very much was triggered by um, Miyamiya issues. So I put, it was probably my most emotional time making art and I'm not someone that does that very often. So it was a really powerful experience making my piece and then trying to put it into words afterwards, reflecting on what I've made, looking at everything and wondering how other people are going to perceive it. Um, I think it's very multifaceted and also gives Miyamiya people something to express themselves through or find something to relate within um, that might not be talked about within our community or maybe something they haven't explored for themselves. Um, so really, I just hoped that I could reach another community member or even someone outside the community to better understand their identity, how the tribe functions, how the tribe, how people in the tribe feel. Um, and like I said, it, it was something I haven't really done to that extent before so this was a really you it was a really great opportunity to make something that could be displayed for others um, and used as an educational tool but also kind of like a window into what's going on behind the scenes um, yeah Layla had mentioned that it became very emotional and that's something that was a first for me as well. Um, again, I'm not an art major, so I don't consider myself a very artsy person. Like I'm not very, I'm not creative, I guess, is my thought. And so I went into it being very planned on what I was doing, um, especially on the piece that I had spent a lot of time on. Um, it was beadwork. And that's something that takes a lot of time because you put one bead on at a time when you're doing this certain stitch. Um, and that's a stitch that I have used before, um, but it's always been for, for show, not so much 
for artistic reasons. Um, I would make beadwork to wear at powwows or for other people to wear at powwows. And this was the first time that there was actually purpose behind the designs I was coming up with. And I pretty much had it all drawn out bead by bead what I was going to make. And I had reasonings for all the designs. And as I went, I realized that those designs were not always appearing the way that I had drawn them or I'm oops, I might've like messed up and put the wrong color in. So now what am I going to do? And so I would turn away from those designs and just start going with the flow and seeing what came of them as I went. Um, and so when I was done, I more reflected on it and I, and I still had some of the designs that I had planned and some of them were not planned. And I was like, oh, but this, this makes sense because, and, and I would associate it with, with my culture or our sovereignty, sovereignty or our class or whatever it may be. And suddenly these designs were very emotional, especially the ones that I didn't plan. I was like, wow, this is more Miamia than I realized. Or like, I've got goosebumps now just thinking about how sometimes it just, it works out or something within me decided that it, there was a better plan than what I had. And it was kind of need to do well this is this and this is amazing to hear the experiences and how you related uh on such a personal level and uh i i want to turn back to george and kara uh you know the the majority of the works in the student response exhibition are not created by Miami students uh, which we fully expected. Uh, when you were working with us in making the selections as part of the jury process, with what criteria were you basing your choices on and how much of it was relating to, you know, you have obviously some different understandings of sovereignty than others and how much of that was was uh interjected from you know on 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 your behalf Sorry, Mila. <laughs> yeah. um yes i think when I, when I was looking um and reviewing the pieces i was very much leaning on the students explanations um, you know, not knowing the cultural background of all the artists, I knew I wouldn't have the ability to, to in any way interpret their art. Um, I could have my own interpretation of it where I could say, oh, that looks like, you know, that looks like land and community to me. But so I really had to lean on, on, their, on their explanations. And I was really drawn to those students who uh, connected land and community. Um, of those, although their you know, identity was one of the elements. Um, I was, you know, I began to think of identity in the review process as more the individual part, and I was really interested in that collective um, and how the students talked about their, their art connecting to the collective, to their understanding of whatever collectives they belong to or connect to, and especially, um, especially for me, land was the, the bigger of the two. Um, so I didn't, I didn't really see much expression, nor did I expect much expression or explanation connecting directly to sovereignty, but instead connecting more to these, what we consider to be the building blocks of sovereignty or, or uh, to adopt the less hierarchical um, example that Kayla gave, the, the cycle of sovereignty um, in, in the process of the, the uh, feedback loop or what have you. Yeah, just to add to that, I think what's become clear through this conversation of, you know, even today, what is sovereignty? Our students talking about the expression of sovereignty and then the idea that this exhibition is called interconnected, right? And I think that's how we think of sovereignty is all of these different pieces that come together to strengthen each other. So thinking about those three pieces that we included um, as part of you know, this call for exhibition, land, identity, and community, I was really looking to the students to be able to identify how is it that their art is expressing at least one of those things, but like George said, hopefully able to connect those pieces together in some way. Um, and as we were reviewing the pieces that were submitted, 
um, it became clear that I think some students were not addressing it at all. And so those were the pieces that, you know, were, were ranked lower. Um, but I wanted to see that students were at least wrestling with these ideas. And it, it is such a, a big topic, sovereignty itself, but even land identity and community can go in so many different directions. So really looking for the students to be able to explain how it was that they were interpreting it through their art. Yeah, you know, it was very interesting how some of the works were more overt, you know, on the surface level as they related and others less so where you really had to read what the students and uh, had written and and some of them were just so personal and so introspective which i think is really wonderful that it, you know so many of the students it was not just about creating something and just trying to get it into the show but that they were really you know majority really trying to connect to this and and especially for those who don't have as much familiarity with sovereignty or familiarity with Nyamya, uh, but that there was there was a, such a strong intent to try to to grapple with that and and i'm really really pleased uh with those works so uh any any other comments from anyone uh anything else that uh perhaps the five of you might want to share or six of you sorry Um, this has been fantastic. And, and again, thank you so much for uh, being a part of this. Uh, it looks like um, we may have uh, some questions. Um, Sherry, would you mind fielding those for us? Sure. Um, so there was a question directed at Kara or George, um, curious about sharing the role of art in the Miamia traditions um, and or in education uh, within the tribe from generation to generation. So looking for the tie-in, uh, maybe also with some programming here at Miami. Sure, so, you know, I think art has become like so many other things that we talk about from a Miamia perspective, like language, for example, it's become incorporated into many different parts of our Miamia experience. It's not typically something that we say, okay, now we're going to look at art. And this is what art looks like from a Miamia perspective, although sometimes it is useful to do that. Um, but more often it becomes a discussion of within another cultural practice or within a Miamia way of knowing and being, what is beauty and how is that expressed through um, the way that we go about the world, um, both the way that we know that our ancestors expressed beauty and how do we look at that and understand what is a Miamia aesthetic and then how do we express that today? Um, you know, so for example, right now I'm with community members who are making cradle boards, um, this, you know, item that you use to carry a baby. Um, and there are pieces of both the physical board and then the, the wrapper and, and um, actually putting a baby on this board that have art that's built into that process, right? Of making this item beautiful. Um, and so from a Miamia perspective, art is not disconnected from our everyday life, right? This item that you pick up and use every day if you have a small child is beautiful and you want to make it beautiful. Um, and I think when we did the ribbon work exhibit at the art museum, I um, had a really, what was for me a, a funny and kind of awakening moment of bringing some of our contemporary pieces of ribbon work to the museum. Um, and these are things like mocks and game pads, which we would be on the ground outside playing with. And then when I walk into the museum and I hand them over to a curator who's wearing white gloves and, and um, taking them as pieces of, of art, right? And so it was, it was really interesting for me to see that dichotomy of 
from a Miyamiya perspective, art is just incorporated into our everyday lives. And it's not something that's held separate as, you know, it needs to be preserved and protected in the way that we typically think of art today. Um, and so I think that comes back a little bit to the idea of, of the theme of this exhibition, right? Interconnected and how does art also interconnect with so many aspects of Miyamiya ways of, of knowing and being, but also hopefully for other students of how it interconnects um, with their own perspectives. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree with everything, Kara. So I just want to add kind of a, a little note at the end, where I, one of the things that that I think we see in the in the older forms of what we call art today is that they um, symbolize or represent the care that others have for people, um, that the ability to wear beautiful clothing, um, which has artistic design on it, is representative of the care that other people are showing you, and that kind of shows its way through through all the art of the past. And yet there's been this development where now we do as a community make art that is to be hung on a wall and looked at. Um, and what what we try to do through our education today is is help our um, help our learners recognize the through lines, the connections in the aesthetics and the thinking that lie behind um, what is produced, whether it's to be worn and to show that care or to be hung on the wall and, and interacted with um, that way. Um, and I think that ethic of care is one of the, the through lines that we try to, to emphasize for people. Thanks, George. So um, there's a few other questions, but I think we really only just have time for one. So I'll pick, um, this one's directed at the students. I'm curious where you think the creative work that is on display in this exhibition um, and the work that you did with this theme of interconnected um, will take you into the future. The theme being, um focused around um, like community, land, identity, culture, and how I guess we represent that. Um, I have that I'm in my last semester um, of school now and the art classes I'm in now, I really am honing in on that focus on identity and like how to express different facets of myself through my artwork and how that looks different between different mediums, how it looks different between which facets of my identity I'm focusing on. Um, and so I think kind of starting that process through my Miami identity, which had um, some more like, I guess, creative outlines, you could say, with like Miami aesthetics and stuff, and then seeing how I can take those concepts and apply them into my, the other art I'm doing, I guess, would be um, where it's kind of taking me and the, just the general like growth of myself as an artist and how I'm able to better express myself in different um, ways is what I've really gotten from this and where it'll probably take me next. Um, so I'm <clears throat> definitely in the same area as Megan there. I think, you know, I, this, uh, this project, both of them that I did, um, really pushed, I pushed myself to be more personal and um, which I tend to struggle with in my art because it's like people are seeing that. <laughs> um, and, you know, and I think that I'm only in my third semester here. And so I'm, I'm starting to put more of myself into what I work on. And I'm starting to think more about how my work can reflect me. And I think that these pieces were a really good jumping off point for that. I still have so much room to grow because I've got mm, three years left <laughs> and I know a lot is gonna change in that time. And, um, but I, yeah, I definitely think that um, this, these two projects have served as a, a starting point for me connecting my Miamiya heritage and more personal parts of myself to my art. 
Um, similar to that uh, struggling with kind of self-expression and having this project be a very personal one, um, not only for me, but I, I'm representing a whole community of people by showcasing Miyamiya art. Um, this was a tough one for me to explore because studying graphic design is less so about self-expression and more so about bringing forth the ideas of others. So having an opportunity to bring forth my own ideas was challenging because I am a very reserved person and having taking the time to look into myself and reflect on that and create something out of it um, made me also think about how this interconnects with my culture, how I interconnect with my culture, how others interconnect with all of these things. Um, so it was a really kind of scary experience. Um, but going forward, I think I will focus more on myself when I decide I want to create art rather than doing work for others with graphics and stuff. I, I think I will give myself more time to connect things um, with myself too. I agree since the art that I've made before has always been planned out and it's been designs that are pretty and not so much meaningful. Um, I know now that moving forward, maybe I am more creative than I let myself believe I am. Um, maybe it doesn't always have to be so planned out and uh, and it's it's okay to have thought and and reasoning behind designs and it's not so much just because it's pretty. Um, so I think that could change my, my artwork moving forward. That's great, thank you all. Uh, that'll be our last question. I just wanted to thank you on behalf of the Art Museum for your participation today. It's super fun to be continuing this Noontime series and to have all of you participating. As I mentioned, we will be posting this on our YouTube channel um, shortly within the week. And I did want to just take a quick moment if I can share my screen real quick, just to uh, remind everyone of some upcoming programs. Let's see how fast I can switch this over. There. So this Saturday, we are having an exhibitions open house. It will run from 12 to 5. And we have drop-in tours of the galleries from 2 to 4. And we have a special screening of Training for Freedom, a PBS film with a question and answer series um, from 2 to 3.30 p.m. So please come to the museum and join us if you can. And then later this month, we have two Wednesday evening programs. Uh, the first is on Wednesday, September the 14th from 5 to 7, entitled Freedom Sounds. Um, and this is going to be a fantastic program uh, with some music, both in the auditorium and in the galleries, as well as a reception. And on Wednesday, September the 21st from 5 to 7, uh, we'll be hosting photographer Mark Clennon, um, also connected with the Lens for Freedom exhibition. And he's going to be sharing points of view, searching, finding, seeing um, his experiences as a photojournalist um, related to civil rights. We also have two more noontime chatters. Um, and these are on the first Wednesday of October and the first Wednesday of November. October the 5th is Finding Freedom Summer Traveling Panel Project, and it will be hosted by our collections manager, Laura Stewart, and guests. And on November the 2nd, our own director, Jack Green, will be hosting with guests a topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion at Miami and at the Art Museum. Thank you again for joining us today. And we hope to see you at our upcoming programs. Have a wonderful afternoon. Nay no way. Nay no way to you all. Shai.